So uh, in this final segment, I wanted to uh, share with you uh, a little bit about a sort of a more advanced use case for Streamlit. So the, even though these fundamental building blocks are themselves extremely uh, easy, hopefully, if not, you should let us know because we're constantly trying to make them easier. I'm not kidding. But even though they're hopefully not you know, super sophisticated, there's not a huge amount to learn about Streamlit, you can actually build really non-trivial apps quite quickly. And so I'm going to tell you a little bit about one of the really driving use cases behind uh, the creation of Streamlit, which was my experience at Zoox working on self-driving cars. And so what we did was all of the, uh, I was an engineering manager there, and all of the engineering managers would meet once a week, and we would basically look at um, instances where the car hadn't behaved as we expected. And so this was the operator of the self-driving car, but it pushed a button or whatever, um, that, uh, figuratively speaking, that uh, caused the car to disengage. And then that was an issue that had to be resolved uh, that week. And so in a sense, this workflow was similar to the software engineering workflow where you have issues coming in and then you need to they go into GitHub or whatever, Jira, and then you, they get assigned to people and then they get fixed. But in this amorphous, crazy world of you know, semi-intelligent vehicles and machine learning, it wasn't that simple, right? You couldn't root cause a neural network. So what was the actual flavor of like debugging a self-driving car? So what it really was, was that the, the engineering leader is sitting around a, a table and we would sort of open up, this is, this is Waymo, uh, just copied off the web, by the way, but same idea. Uh, we would open up an instance, it's a little hard to see there, but in this case, what we have is, it looks like a, uh, someone in a wheelchair following a dog around on the street. And this is the kind of thing, and this is actually quite an exotic example, but this is the kind of thing that happens all the time when you're debugging self-driving cars, is that like, Every single week, no matter how many years you've been working at this, some crazy thing happens that you've never seen before. And you're like, how is the car going to behave in this case? So that's perhaps another answer to the question why this is taking so long. Um, there's tons of weird examples about this. Maps are like that too, by the way. Um, every time you think you've made a map that's like centimeter accurate, some crazy thing happens in the world and your, your map is broken. Okay, so what we'd do is we'd say, Let's figure out uh, at this point, and this is a very complicated, this, you know, this is not just the people in the room. There's like project managers and product managers and stuff. There's this entire sort of ecosystem working on this problem. People are trying to say at this point in time, can we understand what all the sensors were doing, what, in what state all the neural nets were, et cetera, et cetera, the planner. And then can we uh, get it in some sense to an engineer or an engineering team who can sort of break it down further and try to like, quote unquote, reproduce this case. But because there's no such thing as reproduction as such, the, I mean, you, could, you can replicate the state of everything on, on the vehicle, but that, that's only one instance in time. What you're trying to get is a more general understanding of what broke down. What you really want to do is you actually want to create essentially um, searches over your data set for similar instances in time. And then what you want to be able to do is essentially regress those searches over your data sets against different versions of the software running on the car. So you, the, the picture here is that we have data, which is vast. It's, you know, terabytes or exabytes, God knows what, of data. And uh, we want to find subsets of it that are similar to this error case. And then on a, in the other column, we have, quote unquote, column, or let, let's say dimension, we have all the models. Like quote unquote models, because really there's like many, many models running simultaneously on the vehicle. But again, we're going to sort of sidestep that and just think theoretically. So we have data along one dimension, we have models along another dimension, and we want to be able to quickly subset some of these and then look at the intersection. How would the models run on this data? That's sort of the beginning of the process of, of debugging some kind of crazy thing that's happening on a self-driving car. And, and by the way, this is all, you know, when I was at Google X, I wasn't working on the self-driving car team, but I was close to them, and I, this is the exact same process in every project uh, that's working on self-driving cars, no doubt. And so what happened was the engineering teams 
eventually through this complicated, slow process, built internal tooling that made this better and better. And week after week, more features were added until we actually had these really beautiful tools that allowed us to interrogate our own data and then run, run models against it. And this kind of internal tooling is being replicated not only in all of every self-driving car project, uh, but also really in every machine learning project on some level, and especially once you get to a certain size team. So this is an example of sort of the hidden, bespoke internal tooling layer that floats beneath uh, the, the amazing mathematics and, and futuristic technologies of machine learning. And so um, we built an example of this tool in Streamlit. Now, it's a very small, uh, simplified example, but it gives you some idea of how, uh, of how this works. I will invite you to go check out this out on GitHub. And here is another, it's just another little example of uh, Streamlit. I could download this file, but we have a cool little feature, which is that you could just run a Python script directly off um, any URL. So really all this, it is running locally on my computer, just downloading it first, and then, then it's running that. Um, so it's just a little time saver. So we're gonna run this baby, boom. Okay, all right. Um, and so here we are in the app. And uh, I'm gonna go down here to show the source code. Uh, honestly, the point is that this is the entire source code. It's 300 lines. And uh, if you look carefully, let's actually go into the source code and zoom in, you'll see that like literally this is everything that you're seeing, including actually running the neural net somewhere around here, layer by layer, okay? The whole thing is happening and we're not like hiding things in other libraries or something. So this is the source code. Again, it's 300 lines of Python, only 30 streamlet calls. Okay. And uh, so there are some streamlet calls right there. Okay. And um, so let, let's, let's run this and see what happens. So here we go to run the app. Okay. So it's doing some SD cache stuff. Uh, load metadata, by the way, is building this little search engine uh, over the data set. This is the Udacity self-driving car data set. So it's just a nice data set of um, images with boxes around them, basically. Um, and so here we, are, here we can start to say, let's say that the situation was, um, I, you know, we, we, we ran into a situation where there was, um, there were a, a large number of traffic lights, let's say. So let's go to here and we'll say traffic lights. And then we'll go for a large number of traffic lights. Um, and then here, we, actually there's only six images in the data set with over 14 traffic lights, of course. Who's ever heard of over 14 traffic lights? But here we can scrub through it. Uh, let's, let's go for pedestrians. You know what, actually let's make this like way bigger because it's more fun. We can get into the more normal zoom levels. Okay, so, uh, so there we got like a lot of pedestrians now. And here we can scrub through it. Um, and notice that all of this is written without callbacks in the same exact sort of data flow style that I described to you earlier. It's just a script that's run from top to bottom, but it gives you this really convincing illusion of an app, you might say. And then notably down here, it's actually running a neural net in real time. So, and just to, to prove that, here we can, um, we, can, we can change parameters of the neural net itself. So uh, you'll see that as I increase the confidence threshold, um, more and more people get classified as uh, people. Um, and then as I decrease it, you know, fewer and fewer. Uh, and then similarly, there's this thing called the overlap threshold. Um, so these are, actually, these are actually parameters of the net itself. So this net is pre-trained. Um, well, actually, it's not parameters of the net. It's parameters of the post-processing uh, that happens after the neural net is run. So all these objects are detected using YOLO, which is a super awesome uh, object detection uh, net, by the way. And, um, and then you do a little post-processing to figure out um, uh, what's the overlap threshold and stuff of boxes. And these are the kinds of like, you know, as I don't need to tell you, millions and millions of tiny little parameters that are inside the neural net system and which are extremely difficult to debug and really gain intuition about at all. And so you can imagine that we would have not only this one model, but perhaps thousands of versioned models that we could then run against this data set. And so this is an example of an app that like on the one hand, it's 
not very complicated. It seems almost like formulaic, perhaps. Um, just grab some data, grab a model, run one against the other. But on the other hand, there's a lot of very minor, bespoke things about it. And so the ability of for a machine learning engineer or data scientist to build this him or herself directly, open it up and fiddle with it, and then make it available to other people inside the organization, uh, to their coworkers, to their uh, executives, to their interns, uh, and poten potentially far beyond the machine learning group, was really what we were trying to go for uh, when we created Streamlit. And uh, hopefully it's something that you guys are also resonating with as both part of your workflow and also a, a skill that could be useful to you.